Hi, I'm Tommy Thompson, and this is AI in Games, a series on research and applications of artificial intelligence in video games. If you've watched the case study series on this channel, you'll know that I explore how AI is built in commercial video games, but often long after the project's completion. I've never had the opportunity to talk to a studio more candidly about their experiences and the path their work has taken from initial concept to being on store shelves and surviving in the modern gaming ecosystem. And this is what brought me here, on the outskirts of the town of Twycross in the English Midlands, as I was invited to the offices of Rare, one of the most revered and seasoned studios in the British games industry. In March of 2018, Rare released Sea of Thieves, an online pirate adventure game that not only brought a unique experience to the Xbox platform, but helped redefine the studio's identity. Join me as I go behind the scenes with some of the programming team responsible for Sea of Thieves and learn firsthand not only how the game was built, but the ongoing dedication and craft as it sees continued updates and improvements today. Rare is one of the longest serving companies in the British games industry and has survived for over 30 years by evolving and adapting to the changes in the market. First developing titles on the ZX Spectrum, to forging a strong partnership with Nintendo in the 1990s, and now as one of Microsoft's internal studios supporting the Xbox brand. In 2015, following the release of three titles in the Kinect Sports series and the anniversary collection Rare Replay, the studio had focused its efforts on something completely different a project that would challenge not just the types of games they made at the studio, but how they were going to make them as well. Sea of Thieves is derived from a desire to do something unique. Whilst Rare sought to move towards creating a live service game, something they had never done before, its design was intended to be player-centric. Players can tackle missions from different quest givers at their own pace, allowing you to prioritise the experiences you enjoy the most and keep the game as accessible as possible. In return, Players not only increase their standing with different factions, but earn currency to acquire a variety of new cosmetics. A cool new hat or peg leg, a nice top sail for your ship, or a gold-trimmed water bucket. Through this approach, players can derive their own satisfaction from achieving tasks in the game. From attacking skeleton forts, to sailing through storms and playing sea shanties with strangers, along with a tankard of grog or two. But it all started from more humble beginnings. The very early days, there were it was just an island, and there were just naked men, because um, those were the only models we had. And there was no there was no voice chat or text chat, so all you could do was jump up and down in front of each other. Uh, it was it sounds it sounds ridiculous. It was vaguely ridiculous because we all had the same player model, but we did have a really nice island in, and we had our we started to get our waves in that were always looking nice, and we had this beautiful sunset. And I remember at one point I was just jumping around the island. Um, and I went up to the top of this cliff, this kind of mountain, a beautiful sunset. And there was there was someone with me and I, I had no idea who it was. So we just jumped at each other for a little bit. And then we just kind of stopped and looked out over this beautiful sunset. And it, it, it felt like a genuine moment. Like we had no way of talking. I have still no idea who it was. Over time, Sea of Thieves has developed a dedicated fan base that continues to sail the seas for adventures that can challenge even the most ardent of pirate legends. Much of this is thanks to Rare's continued development of the game, with four major updates within eight months after the game's release. Meanwhile, the anniversary update will kickstart the 2019 content drops as Rare supports the game for the foreseeable future, with the introduction of PvP mode The Arena, the new Tall Tales storyline, as well as new gameplay mechanics. These new features, combined with continued refinement of existing ones, seek to mix things up in new and interesting ways that add layers of complexity to the core gameplay. 
The game has a variety of AI systems under the hood that continues to increase with each update. While the game launched with traditional humanoid enemies such as the skeletons as well as ambient AI on islands such as snakes and pigs, the game has focused on expanding its roster of sea-based threats that can threaten you and your ship. Not content with sharks and the Kraken launch, 2018 saw the addition of the Megalodon and Haunted Galleons, with each continuing to change and evolve with each new expansion. All of this requires systems that balance that experience, ensuring this online world with hundreds of AI characters is stable and manageable as pirate crews sail the seas and get up to all sorts of shenanigans on each server. Plus, by virtue of it being a live service game, the project needs to be maintained in a manner that it can be iterated upon quickly, allowing for new content to be released frequently and ensures the game continues to be stable for players, all the while achieving this without overworking the development team. And even AI has a part to play there too. But before any of that can come into play, let's consider its earliest beginnings and how Sea of Thieves was built. Having been invited to Rare's offices by Andy Bastable, the principal gameplay engineer on Sea of Thieves, I was keen to learn as much as I could not just about the AI behind the game, but how it all came to be in the first place. Sea of Thieves is built in Epic's Unreal Engine 4, which is of course not just one of the most popular commercial video game engines, but one that has a strong reputation within the AAA video game industry. Unreal is known for being a reliable engine, both for networked gameplay and cross-platform development which was critical given the intention to launch an online game that runs on both Xbox One and PC whilst connected into the Xbox Live ecosystem. In addition, UE4 arguably has the most robust set of AI tools available in a commercial engine for developers to work with. Not only does it provide a suite of navigation mesh tools, which ensure characters can move across surfaces and recognise changes in terrain, but it also has the behaviour tree system for creating versatile behaviours that are responsive to in-game events. Plus, while still in an experimental stage when Sea of Thieves started production, the Environmental Query System, or EQS, can simulate sensory inputs and minimise performance overheads for checking whether characters can be seen or heard in proximity. However, that still wasn't enough for what Rare had in mind, given, as we'll see throughout these videos, only the skeletons and other land-based AI such as pigs and chickens are built entirely using the original AI frameworks with a bit of Rare's own special spices, of course. A big reason for this is that the game largely takes place in water, either swimming around or in rowboats and ships, and navigation meshes don't support that, a point that I'll come back to later. Fortunately, UE4 provides access to the engine's source code. This enabled the developers to build their own custom water navigation system and then hook it into the existing navigation framework of the engine, a point I'll return to in part 2 when we look at the shark AI. Plus, as we'll see in part 3, enemies such as the Kraken and Haunted Ships required bespoke tools that would enable the AI to behave in a way that simply isn't possible in UE4 by default. So once again, Rare were able to create unique systems that fit into the existing Unreal Engine AI workflow and ensure the toolchain doesn't become too unwieldy to manage. As mentioned, I'm going to explore how all of these AI threats are designed throughout the series. However, in the meantime, if you're watching and don't understand what either a behaviour tree or navigation mesh is, be sure to check out my AI 101 episodes on each topic, where I explore what these things are and why they're so important for making AI in games. At the time of this video, Sea of Thieves is now one year old, having been released on March 20th, 2018. And during this first year, the game carried three main activities for players to participate in. Each of these activities have their own requirements and dependencies in terms of gameplay, mission construction and AI behaviours where necessary. Non-player characters based at outposts allowed for you to collect missions from one of three trading companies. The Gold Hoarders, where you travel to specific islands and dig up buried treasure. The Merchant Alliance, that asks players to acquire specific items be it animals such as pigs and chickens, or cargo runs full of rum and plants, and deliver them to islands across the open world. And lastly, there is the Order of Souls, where you need to go to one or more tropical locales, find undead skeleton warriors, kill them all over again, and then sell their skulls for gold, which, you know, isn't creepy at all. In each instance, these missions require gameplay systems to generate AI characters at runtime in order to facilitate the mission's requirements. 
For example, an Order of Souls mission not only requires skeletons to spawn onto specific islands for the player to fight against, but also the specific high-value targets you need to take out. Meanwhile, in Gold Hoarders and Merchant Alliance quests, skeleton warriors will still appear on islands at specific times in order to present a challenge and get in the way between you and your loot. Plus, in Merchant Alliance quests, where animals need to be captured, the game needs to make sure these animals are actually going to spawn in for you in certain regions of the islands. This has since been embellished with the recent anniversary update, which introduced a fourth trading company, Hunter's Call, that introduced fishing mechanics and new fish AI to go along with it. With a mission in play, the game not only needs to ensure these characters are spawning in, but they're balanced in terms of number and difficulty based on the size of the player's crew, the location the mission will take place in, the ranking of the player who acquired the mission from the trading company, as well as the mission type itself. And that's where a little bit of procedural generation comes into play, as Rob Masella and Stuart Holland explained to me. The, um, like, particularly the bounties are, like, how many enemies you run into, um, how many captains there are in a given mission are constrained within a set of parameters, but um, each mission is generated at um, purchase time when you spend the in-game gold to buy the mission. It, it decides which island it's going to go to or which series of islands. Yeah, which location. They all, they're all, each bounty is based around some location on an island, so... Yeah. Uh, there's several we can pick out of with each island, so and they'll they'll split up and it'll um, like around that location, so that you'll end up with a different kind of minute to minute tactical um, fight with them with the skeletons when you actually get there, because sometimes they'll be out and exposed on the beach and you can shoot them with cannons, and sometimes they'll be right in the middle of the island in a cave, and you'll have to go kind of down in and and if you end up with a bunch of metal skeletons in a cave that you can't get your ship to, <laughs> and you're like, <sighs> so you're carrying in explosive barrels to try and get rid of them. Over time, each of these mission types scale in their own unique ways, providing an ever-increasing challenge, not just for players, but designers too. Yeah, it was, it would, we, we had those exact three strands just to kind of cater to different players and what, they, what they'd like to do, so. Yep. Or, people to jump in and out of, so. That's why you can progress in each of them individually. You don't need to do a mix of them, you can just do one, one of the kinds of quests if you want. Each of these mission strands scale independently from one another, allowing players to prioritise quest lines they prefer and not to be punished or left confused when picking up missions from other trading companies. Hence, you can decide after hours of playing through the Order of Souls to do a quick run for the Merchant Alliance, but the scale and difficulty of that subsequent mission won't be influenced by your preceding hours of play. But this presents a much bigger problem for AI performance and networking, given your crew isn't the only one on a given server. This is similar to the challenges raised when I looked at the AI of Tom Clancy's The Division, where the game had to balance all the AI behaviours happening out in the active world. How do you maintain the performance of the game world with all these AI characters running around? It was a big topic that we discussed at length in the studio, and while the exact maths involved is still a secret, what I did learn is that the AI characters for each mission are only spawning in when necessary and not wasting CPU and memory resource by running around on an island that's miles away from the nearest player or sailing the seas when nobody is going to notice them. This process helps ensure that while one crew might be busy hunting a megalodon, it doesn't impact the crew on an island completing an Order of Souls mission. AI characters such as pigs and chickens don't spawn on islands until crews are close enough that they might actually see them. But in addition, pigs, snakes and skeletons on the same island as players often go dormant when not in combat and beyond the line of sight of any human player. It's a safe tactic to employ that minimises unnecessary computation on server side, given nobody's going to notice what happens to these characters anyway, freeing up server resources that could be put to better use elsewhere. As we'll see in the upcoming episodes, this philosophy holds true for the likes of the Skeleton Galleons, the Megalodon and the Kraken. However, the rules of these systems are unique in each instance and run on completely separate services and behaviour systems. Bringing this swashbuckling adventure to players already sounds like a daunting task, but this is just the beginning and I still have a lot of exciting topics to cover. Here's just a taste of what's still to come. The behaviour tree architecture of the skeleton AI and how they're built to use the same control as humans. We got them to kind of run around and uh, hold up the lantern and flash it in front of players and then run away again. Yeah, it's, and it, it, again, it was quite easy to do, it was quite fun as a, a way of just learning the behaviour side. How sharks required a completely different navigation system at launch. 
The deadliest threats deep under the sea. Megan and Karen? The looming threat of Skeven? Ske Skeven, seriously? What was the name for the skeleton ship that oh, never that really Skeven, took off? Skeven, that was terrible. And finally, we're going to look at the automated testing framework that enabled Rare to extensively test the game during development, minimise errors and enable faster and more streamlined deployment of the game both before and after launch. Thanks for watching part one of the AI of Sea of Thieves here on AI in Games, a series brought to you by its supporters on Patreon.